It's all right. It is really good to be here and good to see all of you here today. Today we're going to start a, another little thought in, uh, in the uh, next few sermons that we're going to be looking at because <clears throat> as I listen to people um, ask questions and, and just dialogue with people from time to time, uh, especially people who are not consistently in church, not consistent followers of Jesus or even unbelievers, I find out that people have a whole bunch of stuff in their belief system that they believe came from the Bible but obviously came from a misrepresentation of what the Bible really says. And so what we're going to talk about today is this lesson that's entitled, How to Understand the Bible. How to Understand the Bible. And we don't have a screen up yet, do we? Well, it's, it's a smith. <laughs> You'll get it. There we go. All right, so... How to Understand the Bible. And we're going to start in Acts chapter 8. We're going to read some excerpts from verses 30 to 31 of Acts chapter 8, where the scripture says this. We'll wait just a minute and let him get it up there. He's getting a little reinforcement now. We're looking for it. Here we go. How to Understand the Bible. And here are the verses. Philip heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading, Philip asked? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. Those verses are taken from a story about an Ethiopian official, the treasurer under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. He had gone to Jerusalem, and maybe he had conducted some official business there. But while he was there, he picked up a copy of the scroll of Isaiah the prophet. He was evidently interested in learning more about this God of the Jews. And so he was reading through the book of Isaiah in that scroll, and he was just baffled. He could not understand what was going on there, and the Lord knew that, so the Lord sent Philip to give him instruction about that. And he's, because the, the guy knew that he couldn't understand it, and so this is what he said. Philip asked him, do you understand what you're reading? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me? Do you get that? Unbelievers, which is probably where this guy was, or even new believers who have no experience handling the word of God, need someone to explain it to them. That's why when we tell the Jesus story, we try to explain it as simply as we can, where people can understand it, they can connect the dots and see their need for Jesus to give them the gift of eternal life. That's why once people get saved, we try to take some fundamental teachings from Scripture, show them the verses, and then show them in as simple a way as we can what the Bible says that God wants from us and for us. And so that's what we do. And so one of the first things you got to do is you got to help people understand the Bible, how to understand the Bible. So I want to say this, the fact that among Christians in today's world, there are hundreds of vastly different belief systems. Would you agree with that? Tons of different belief systems, all purporting to be from the Bible. And there, there is a I mean, that is evidence that there is a, a gross misunderstanding of what the Bible actually teaches. Because listen, if you believe it teaches one thing and I believe it teaches something else, there are three possibilities. You're aware of that, right? Either I'm right and you're wrong. That's what I like to think about. Or you're right and I'm wrong. I don't like to think about that one. Or maybe we're both wrong and God has another answer altogether, but we cannot both be right. You get that? And so the, the idea, uh, the, the fact that there are so many different belief systems, all purporting to be Christianity, shows us that there is a gross misunderstanding of the Bible. The fact that someone is interested in what the Bible says does not necessarily mean that he knows how to understand it when he reads it. A non-believer who is drawn by the Holy Spirit to the point of at least wanting to know what the Bible says 
is quite incapable of understanding it because the Holy Spirit does not live in him. And the scripture says that the things of God are spiritually discerned. We must have the Holy Spirit as our teacher. That is one of the things that Jesus said the Holy Spirit would do for us. He said, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I have said. So a non-believer is incapable of understanding the scriptures on his own because he doesn't have the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. He needs someone to explain it to him. That's where we come in as witnesses for the Lord. Now, not only that, but even a new believer who has no experience in, in handling the word of God is, is, very, is incapable of understanding what it says. And that was the case here, unless someone explains it to me. That was the case of that Ethiopian eunuch that Philip met out in the desert. He was reading from the Bible. He was reading from a handwritten scroll of Isaiah the prophet, but he realized he couldn't understand it on his own. That's what he said. He said, how can I unless someone explains it to me? Now, a major role, I want you to get this, a major role of those who are evangelists, that's trying to tell the Jesus story to people that don't know it yet, and disciple makers, that's taking baby Christians and help them be transformed into fully devoted followers of Jesus. So a major role for us who are evangelists and disciple makers is to explain to the non-believer or to the new believer what the Bible says. You get that? Not give your opinion, not what pastor so-and-so said, not what father so-and-so said or rabbi so-and-so said, but what does God say in his word? And then we got to help them understand what they can do to get to the point that they can understand the Bible. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. I want to give you five important questions. There are five questions that you can ask about any section of Scripture that's in your Bible. And if you get the right answer to these five questions about that section of Scripture, you can have a good understanding of what the Bible says at that point. In our personal quest to understand the Bible and to help others understand it, we need to learn to ask these five questions about any verse of Scripture. And I want to give you the questions, and then we're going to go back and talk about each one of them. The first one is, who said it? The second one is, to whom did he say it? The third one is, exactly what did he say? And the next one is, why did he say it? Does why did he say it make a difference? I think so. And then the last one is, when did he say it? Does that make a difference? I think so. And we're going to look at each one of those five. We're going to briefly examine each of these five very important questions. So let's start with, who said it? Now, now this question is important because not everything recorded in the Bible was said or written by a reliable source of information. Now, don't misunderstand. The Bible is a reliable source of information, but the Bible records the words of people who were not reliable sources of information. The Bible records the words of the devil. Is he a reliable source of information? The Bible records the words of some people who were foolish. They were idiots. They gave bad counsel, but, but the counsel they gave is recorded in the Bible. Do you want to take the counsel of somebody who's given bad advice? No, but, but so you got to pay attention to this issue of who said it. Let me, let me give you a for example. Um, some things, as I said, that the devil said are recorded in the Bible. Here it is. I'll give you this example. In Genesis chapter 2, the last part of verse 16 and verse 17, there in the Garden of Eden, God called Adam aside and he said to him, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now that came from God. Is God a reliable source of information? Absolutely. But then the devil said to Eve, and remember Eve had not even been created yet when God said that to Adam. So the best that she could possibly have had was second-hand information. And the, and the devil comes to Eve and he says, you will not surely die. Is the devil a good source of information? He totally disagreed with what God said. Does it make a difference who said it in this case? Well, because she believed the devil, the consequences were disastrous. 
Moses wrote about that in Genesis chapter 3, the last part of verse 6 and down into verse number 8. It says, she, referring to Eve, she took some and ate it, and nothing happened. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then what happened? <coughs> Disaster struck in the garden. Their fairy tale life in the garden suddenly became a horrible nightmare because sin came crashing down on them, them because they had disobeyed what God said. They chose to believe the devil rather than believe God. God said, you'll surely die. The devil said, you won't surely die. And so then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together. They made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And men and women have been running from God from that day till this because the curse of sin came on to planet Earth at that very moment. People have been trying to hide from God from that day till this. People have been trying to solve their own problem of sin from that day to this. They tried to cover up the evidence of their sin by making fig leaf aprons for themselves, but that wasn't good enough. God had another plan, and so God made coverings for them of animal skins, which demanded the blood sacrifice of an innocent victim. Fast forward centuries and centuries and centuries, and you've got John the Baptist pointing at Jesus as he walked across the landscape of Palestine and saying, behold, the Lamb of God, who does what? Takes away the sin of the world. The only way our sin problem can be solved is through the blood of an innocent sacrifice. That's all through the Old Testament. That's in the New Testament. In the New Testament, it's revealed that Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. When he died on the cross and his blood was shed on the cross, then he provided a way for us to be made right with God, for our sin problem to be solved, for us to escape the horrible consequences of sin. Now, it's also important to ask who said it because the advice, as I said, of foolish men are also recorded in Scripture. For example, Job's three friends. You read the book of Job? Job really had a bad day. He lost it all. He lost his family. He lost his wealth. He lost his health. He was sitting out in the garbage dump, scraping himself with a piece of a broken pot, wishing he could die. He was in bad shape. And then his three friends come along, and they give him all kinds of advice. And by the way, it was all bad advice. Here's how we know that. Um, because... In the midst of his suffering, God responded to Job's friends and said they were wrong. Now, we don't like to hear that, do we? But God just said they were wrong. Look, look, look at what Job wrote. It's in Job 42, verses 7 and 8. He wrote, after the Lord had finished speaking with Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, that was one of the friends, I am angry with you and your two friends. Those are the other two that came along to help Job, Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Naamathite. And then he tells them why God is angry with him and his friends. For you have not been right in what you have said about me. <laughs> what makes God angry? When we give people information about God that is not right. If it is not right, what is it? It's wrong. Get that? And that angers God. And so in order to avoid giving people information that is wrong about God, that is not right about God, we need to learn how to understand the Bible. And one of those important questions is, who said it? When you're reading any section of Scripture, you certainly don't want to take advice from three guys like the friends of Job, even though their advice is recorded in the Bible. Here's another one. To whom did he say it? Isn't that important? Who is he talking to? Is he talking to one individual? Is he talking to one nation? Is he talking to everybody on the planet in every generation? Who is he talking to? Maybe he's talking to just a group of people in a certain time frame. But who is he talking to? You've got to get that down. That's another vitally important question because not everything said in the Bible is intended to be instruction for everyone. Sometimes it is speaking to only one individual or to one nation. Statements in the Bible must be applied only to the individual or to the nation to whom they were spoken. 
unless there's some indication that this is general and this is a universal and applies to everybody, unless that's clear in the text, then you need to let it apply to who it was spoken to. That's important. For example, can I read you something out of the Bible? Genesis 6, 14 to 16. I want you to get this. <coughs> it says this. Build a large boat from cypress wood and waterproof it with tar inside and out. Then construct decks and stalls throughout its interior. Make the boat 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. Then leave an 18-inch opening below the roof all the way around the boat. I assume that was for ventilation. Put the door on the side <coughs> and build three decks inside the boat, lower, middle, and upper. Is that in the Bible? It is, isn't it? Who is, who is he talking to? Noah. Just Noah? Just Noah. <coughs> you see, failure to realize that these words were spoken only to Noah would mean that every person should have a boat under construction in the backyard. But it's not designed for everyone. These words were not spoken to everyone. These words were only spoken to Noah. So we need to understand that it's important to ask, to whom was it written? And there are some Bible verses that record Jesus' instructions specifically to the 12 apostles. He was just talking to those 12. He wasn't talking to everybody. Um, missing that fact has caused some well-meaning Bible preachers and teachers to erroneously believe that all believers should be doing what Jesus did specifically when he instructed the 12 to do it. If you don't pay attention to who he was talking to and he told the 12 to do it, and then some people take that and they think that everybody's supposed to do it. But listen, there was some stuff those 12 were told to do that nobody else did. Because God had a special plan and a purpose for those 12. And he gave them some information that they needed to know, some instructions that, that they needed to follow for the ministry he had given them. It wasn't for everyone. For example, in uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, and then in down in, in verse number 8, it says, these 12, these 12, so who's he talking to? Who's he talking about? Just the 12. These 12, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Here's the instructions. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have rep leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Now let me ask you this. According to other places in Scripture, is everybody supposed to heal the sick? In, in teaching the church at Corinth, Paul asked the question, do all have the gifts of healing? What was the implied answer? No. Now, do some people have it? Yes. All 12 of the apostles had it, and he told them to go use it right then when he was sending them out. And then raise the dead. I, I just never hear anybody argue about that one. Is everybody supposed to raise the dead? No. But who was he talking to here? The 12, do we find evidence in Scripture that at least some of the 12 did that? Yes. And then cleanse those who have leprosy. Was everybody supposed to do that? No. Who was he talking to? The 12. And then drive out demons. Everybody supposed to do that? No. Well, what about the 12? Yes. You get that? Further, over in your Bible, in the book of Acts, the timeline runs forward. And there were these seven sons of a Jewish priest named Siva, and they were going around trying to cast out demons. Do you remember what happened to them? The guy with the demons jumped on them and beat them and wounded them and drove them out of the house, wounded and bleeding and naked. Everybody's not supposed to be trying to do that. Who is? In this case, the apostles. And then later on, as the apostles died off, the Lord gave spiritual gifts to the church. And one of those gifts is he gives some people the ability to drive out demons. But does he give that to everybody? No. So we need to understand. It's important to ask that question, to whom did he say it? Now here's another one. And this one is really important. Exactly what did he say? Exactly what did he say? This question is vitally important because... The problem of people not accurately understanding exactly what was said was a problem at least as far back as the days of Jesus' ministry on earth. Jesus was explaining to Peter the kind of death he would die when Peter looked around and saw John standing nearby. I love this. Peter was just like a lot of people in our world today. 
you, you start you know, revealing to them their responsibility, and what's their question? Well, what about him? What about her? You get that? You tell them where they messed up, and they want to tell you where somebody else messed up. Is that true? You get that? So what we need to understand here is that kind of problem of, of not fully understanding and trying to get the focus off of us onto somebody else has been here ever since the days of Jesus. So Peter looks around, and, and, and he sees John standing nearby, and this was his question. Lord, what about him? That's in John 21, 21, the last part of the verse. Now, in response to Peter's question, what about this guy? Jesus replied, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. So what did Jesus tell him? In short, he told Peter that his plan for John was none of Peter's business. Isn't that what he told him? Don't worry about, don't worry about John, Peter. you got enough to be concerned about with what you're supposed to do for me. Let me take care of what John is supposed to do for me. And so that was his answer. If I want him to remain alive until I come back again, that's none of your business. That's what he told him. But some of his followers evidently overheard what Jesus said to Peter, but didn't fully understand the statement. They only got part of it. How many, how many things as you study through the Bible do you come across and you say, oh, I used to believe this, but oh, uh, according to this verse, I can't believe that anymore. Why? Because sometimes we don't have all the information we need. And look at this, look at this. John wrote, because of this, that is because some folks overheard this and they didn't fully understand what Jesus said, because of this, the rumor spread among the believers. So these, these are Christians that believe this. The rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. So they were expecting John to live till Jesus came back again. So either they thought Jesus was going to come back again really soon, or they thought that John was going to live a really, really long time because they only had partial information. Then look, but Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? Do you get that? So if you don't ask the question exactly what did he say, you would be among those who believe that John was going to live till Jesus came back. Do you see that? It's important to find out exactly what he said. So it's obvious, obviously important to know exactly what is said in God's word. And to get the precise meaning of what the Bible says, you must accurately define every word in a verse. You get that? You got to do what I call a word search. You got to get you a Strong's Concordance or something like that where you can find out what Greek word was translated into this English word and what that Greek word meant in the first century when it was spoken. you got to define it like that. Do you understand that? And, and it's important that we get that, that we go back to those original languages to look at those words and see what they mean because of this, because of this. You know, God, God developed the Greek language at the time in history just prior to the coming of Jesus as a result of Alexander the Great, great Greek leader, commander-in-chief of the Greek army, conquering the known world of that day. And Alexander decided that it would be a lot easier for everybody in the conquered empire to learn Greek to do business with his government than for his government officials to have to learn all these different languages. So Greek became a universal language. Everybody knew a little bit of Greek. And Greek was the most precise language that has ever been developed. And then right after Jesus came, guess what happened? The Romans had taken power. The Greek empire had fallen apart by the time Jesus got here. And in a generation or two, the Greek language fell out of disuse. It died. The Greek language died. You know what happens to a language when it dies? The word meanings, the vocabulary meanings of the words are frozen in history. So you can go back and get a Greek dictionary that was written in the first century. And those Greek words mean the same thing today that they meant then because it's not still being spoken. What about English? English is a living language, right? We're still speaking it generation after generation. Isn't that true? So if you, <clears throat> if you 
read your Bible, an English version of the Bible, if it was written in 1611, and that's when the King James Bible was translated, I'm not bashing the King James Bible, it's a good translation, but if you read those English words there, and then you have to fast forward to where we are now from 1611 to 2023, and that language is still being spoken, what happens to the word meanings in each generation when a language is still being spoken? They change. They change. You say, no, I don't believe that. Well, let me give you an example. Oh, this is a humorous example. Hope it doesn't offend you. Suppose you're having a family reunion. And you, you got a couple of little kids playing here on the floor. And she's, great grandma is there. And she looks at you and she looks at your little boy. And she says to you, oh, son, you have a gay child. What does she mean? Happy, joyful. But what if your cousin looks at you and says, hey, bub, I think you've got a gay child. What does he mean? Something radically different. And you see, in just a very short period of time, the definition of that word has changed drastically in English. Do you get that? And so it's, it's important for us to go back and see the, the precise definition of the words when they were spoken instead of a, a new definition that we may apply to that word. And, and look, for that reason, Jesus said this in John, excuse me, Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, the last part of the verse. He said this, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So in order to get the correct meaning of any verse of Scripture, you have to correctly define every word in the verse. Isn't that what he's saying there? Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then the other question, another one is, why did he say it? This question motivates us to leave the verses of the Bible in the historical context in which they are written. We must have at least some awareness of what was going on during the time and at the place to which these verses were originally directed. Why did he say it? What was going on that motivated him to say this? Failure to do so will result in the mistaken view that the scriptures contradict themselves. I'll give you an example. God told a woman in the Old Testament to never cut her son's hair. You're aware of that, right? In the Old Testament, it's there. He told this woman, never cut her son's hair. The son that was, that was born to this woman was Samson. And, and God then explained the answer to the question, why did he say that? Why did he send the angel to tell this woman, don't ever cut your son's hair? This is what Ezra wrote in Judges 13, the last part of verse number 5. For he will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. He will begin to rescue Israel from the Philistines. You see, the instruction given to Samson's mother were special instructions given regarding a special boy, a boy that was going to be dedicated as a Nazarite from birth. And that special boy was called by God for a special purpose, and that was to rescue Israel from the Philistines who had conquered them and were oppressing them at the time. The Old Testament vow of a Nazarite required no cutting of a man's hair during the entire time he was under a vow. Most of the time that vow only lasted for a few days or maybe a few weeks, but in, in Samson's case, it lasted for his entire life. So obviously then, if his hair has never been cut, as a pre-adolescent, as a teenager, as a young adult, as an older adult, he would have extremely long hair. Isn't that true? He would have long hair, okay? However, when Paul wrote to the believers at Corinth, he said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. Do not, does not, or doth not, this is King James, it's hard for me to read. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame to him? So did God tell this mother in the Old Testament to do something shameful? No, because you got to understand exactly why God said what he said to Samson's mother. It was according to the law of the Nazarite vow, and God had called this boy to be a Nazarite for his whole life so his hair would never be cut. In the, in the, in the New Testament, when you get over to Paul's letter of 1 Corinthians, 
He's not, con- he's not contradicting that Old Testament statement. He's simply making a statement that needed to be made because of what was going on in the city of Corinth at the time. He doesn't contradict himself. In the Judeo-Roman culture of 53 to 54 AD, when Paul wrote this verse to the church at Corinth, if a man had long hair, it was a dishonor to him. He said a shame is the word that King James uses. Some of the other versions use dishonor. It was a dishonor to him because it portrayed him as feminine. You see, in the culture of the first century Judeo-Roman era, just a general guy, not under a Nazarite vow, but just a general guy, if he let his hair grow long, and you also have to define the word long, in their culture, long hair meant long enough that you could pull it around and cover your face with it. Because they had this high moral standard regarding their women, then that moral standard was that no man was ever supposed to see the face of this woman other than males who were in her immediate family, like her dad, her uncles, her brother, maybe her cousins, could see her face. No other man outside the family was supposed to see her face until her wedding night. Then her husband was the first one outside the family, first male, to ever see her face. That's why they wore a veil. In, in, in Middle Eastern countries today, they still wear veils. That's why. It's part of their culture, part of their heritage, okay? So so if she's at home and her brother comes in with one of his buddies, he throws the tent flap back, and there she is inside without her veil on. You know what she needs to be able to do to protect her modesty? Pull her hair around and cover her face with it. So long was long enough that she could pull it around and cover her face with it. So it was a shame for a man to have long hair, that length of hair, in that culture because that indicated that he was struggling with femininity. He was struggling with some gender identity issues, and we think that's all new today. It's not new. It's just reared its ugly head again in this culture in which we live, and so we need to get that. Um, you you, got to understand what he actually said in the verse and why he said it. Um, Back in the 1970s when I was a teenager, most of the boys had longer hair than what a lot of them do now, okay? Down on your collar, part in the middle, feathered back. None of you remember that. Brad, you probably had that when you, you still got it, right? The part's just wider, right? Okay? So, you know, we, uh, that was the way it was. And then these evangelists would come in. And I got saved when I was 16, so I was going to church when I could. And these evangelists would come in. And you know what one of their sermons, if they preached a youth-oriented revival, you know what one of the sermons was almost every time? Now, this wasn't their title, but this is the title I gave it. Get a haircut, boy! That's what it was. Any of you remember that? Yeah. It's a shame for you to have long hair. And what they really meant was it's a sin for you to have long hair. It doesn't say that. It's, even in their culture, it said shame. Do you get that? So what's the, what's the whole purpose under why he said that? It was because they didn't want to dishonor themselves by appearing in a way that would send out a message that they were struggling with this moral issue of gender identity. Do you see that? That was the issue. It really didn't have as much to do with the length of the hair as it had to do with the signal that you send out. Now let me ask you this. Are the things that men can do today to send out the wrong signal? that send out the signal that you may be struggling with gender identity? Isn't there? Yeah. I won't go into a lot of those, but they're there. And so we need to understand that's the issue. That's why he said what he did. So, so why did he say it? Because it was of the, uh, of the undesirable impression it would leave on people living in the cultural norm of that day at that place and the negative impact it would have on the testimony of the man in question. And we could go on and on with things like that. But let's go to another one. When did he say it? This is the final one. When did he say it? Um, This is another important issue to deal with when attempting to understand the Bible. Um, Did he say it during the time period of the Old Testament? Or did he say it during the time period of the New Testament? Those are two big, huge divisions in your Bible. And by the way, those aren't the only divisions in your Bible, but those are some huge divisions in your Bible. 
Failure to consider this question might result in some rather bizarre behavior on the part of God's people today. For example, the Bible says this. Okay, I want you to get this. Now, the Bible says this. It's recorded in Leviticus chapter 1, some excerpts from verses 2 to 9. He says, when anyone among you brings an offering to the Lord. Do we bring offerings to the Lord today? We do, don't we? And he says, when any among you brings an offering to the Lord, bring as your offering, I bet nobody did this today, bring as your offering an animal from either the herd or the flock. Anybody? I didn't think so. Then look at this, ladies, you will love this. He says, you are to lay your hand on the head of the burnt offering. You are to slaughter the young bull before the Lord. You are to skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. You are to wash the internal organs and the legs with water. That really makes you want to go get an animal, doesn't it? Then you've got to butcher it. Then you've got to clean it up. Then you give it to the priest, and then look, and the priest is to burn all of it on the altar. When's the last time you brought an offering like that? Why don't we do that today? Well, the answer to the question is wrapped up in the answer to this last question we're dealing with, which is when did he say it? He said that back in the Old Testament when they were under the law of Moses, which contained a sacrificial system. That sacrificial system was to remind them over and over and over and over again that it required the blood of an innocent sacrifice to take care of their sin problem. We don't do that today because the Lamb of God has already come. He's already been sacrificed. He's already died on the cross. He took away the need to do all of that again and again and again and again because it's now a done deal. So, God gave these instructions during that time period. We don't bring offerings to the Lord like that because we live during the time period of the New Testament in keeping with the New Covenant. The instructions in Leviticus chapter 1 that we just read from are no longer applicable to us. They no longer apply. Do you get it? So if you don't ask those five questions and get a correct answer to those five questions, you will meet yourself coming back trying to understand what the Bible says. So it's hugely important that God's people understand the Bible, especially those portions of the New Testament that explain how we can know that we're going to go to heaven when we die. Isn't that what the Bible's all about anyway? What God has done to make a way for our sin problem, the consequences, eternal consequences of our sin to be solved, for us to escape the consequences of sin and have eternal life. Isn't that what the Bible's all about? So it's vastly important that we understand what God has to say about that, about the fact that we can know that we have eternal life. Not hope so, maybe so, if I score enough points, if I'm good enough. Let me ask you this. A lot of people in the world today believe that. They believe that they have to be good enough to get to go to heaven. Here's my question. How good is good enough? Find me a verse on that. It ain't there. You know why? Because it ain't about how good we are. It's about how good Jesus is. He was the only one that was good enough. And we get to go to heaven on his goodness, not on our own. I'm glad I don't have to get there on mine. It's on his goodness. He's the righteous one. He's the one that was good enough that he never sinned, and therefore he could die on a cross to take the consequences for our sin. Do you get that? It's about him. It's not about us and our ability to perform. Now, he wants us to be as good as we can because when we're good, when we do the right thing, we get blessed and rewarded when we get to heaven. Those blessings and those rewards, those are earned. But this whole idea of having eternal life and getting to live forever with Jesus in heaven, that's a gift. You can't earn that. You can only believe that he's done everything necessary to pay for it so he can legitimately offer it to you. Believe that and then simply tell him you want it. And if you do that, he'll give it to you. So it's drastically important. That is the first step in the life of everybody that we meet. We help them understand what the Bible says about that. Because if we don't get that down, does anything else matter? 
if they're going to die and go to hell anyway? Does anything else matter? No. Suppose all their theology is good, but they miss that part of it. It makes no difference. Does that make sense? So here's the thing. I want to tell you the Jesus story one more time. 